how much and how well do you cope with leadership and your responsibilities as a leader? Do you think the unthinkable? Are you being confronted by far too much in this time of disruption? Should you have been thinking about what's happening and be aware of what's happening? Or was what has been taking place really unpalatable? It was there for you to see, but you didn't realize what an impact it was going to have on you. Well, join me, uh, Nick Gowing, and my colleague, Chris Langdon. We're going to be talking about our ongoing big project on how leaders are really being destabilized when they come and face the issue of thinking the unthinkable. Do you think the unthinkable? Congratulations. You are tuned into Dolph Barron's Leadership and Loyalty Show, the number one podcast for Fortune 500 executives and those who are dedicated to creating a quantum leap in leadership. Your host, Dolph Barron, is the founder of FullMontyLeadership.com. He's an executive mentor to leaders like you, a contributing writer for Entrepreneur Magazine, CEO World, and he's been featured on CNN, Fox, CBS, and many other notable sites. Dov Barron is an international business speaker who was named by Inc. Magazine as one of the top 100 leadership speakers to hire. Now, over to Dov Barron. Welcome, dear friends, fans, and fellow aficionados of leadership excellence. Thank you for joining us on this episode of Dov Barron's Leadership and Loyalty Tips for Executives, part of the Full Monty Interview Series. I'm your host, Dov Barron. I'm the founder of Full Monty Leadership, and I'm here to assist you tapping into the one thing in your business that changes everything. Let me ask you, are you committed to up-leveling your leadership? Well, what if I was to tell you that the age-old idea that you are supposed to uh, surround yourself with like-minded people was actually terrible advice? Well, stay tuned and you'll find out why. Remember, you can chat about this episode or any other episodes, any past episodes on our Facebook page. Just go look for it. Go look for Dove Barron's Leadership and Loyalty Podcast. If you're a new listener, new viewer, thank you for joining us. Strap yourself in. We're about to go full Monty. As always, you can find us on iTunes, Spotify, iHeartRadio, wherever you tune into podcasts. And we always need your help in staying relevant. So please get over to where you tune into podcasts, rate, review, and subscribe to the show. And uh, you can also catch us on traditional radio stations across the United States every Monday and Thursday. We are all the way from Georgia to Florida all the way to Wisconsin, Philadelphia, even to the Quantico District of Washington, D.C. You can look for us on Roku TV also, where there's over 100,000 subscribers. Um, If you're a regular listener, regular viewer, thank you. Thank you so much for all that you do because you have made us the number one podcast globally for Fortune 500 listeners. If you're with a potential reach of 2.5 to 4 million listeners, we are honored and grateful to be cited by Inc.com as the number one podcast to make you a better leader. And uh, if you didn't know, you can find us on Spotify, Google Home, and Alexa by simply saying, Play Dove Burn Podcast. Again, thank you for sharing the show with everybody you know. All right, let's strip it down, dive right in. As a leader, whether you're a CEO, someone in the C-suite, sales leader, entrepreneur, or leader in any capacity, you know that we live in what might be the most disruptive time in history. 100-year-old industries are disappearing overnight. Things that were considered normal, have nothing to do with what's going on anymore. In fact, much of what's going on today would be considered unthinkable not very long ago. The question is, how can we as leaders thrive in a time where the unthinkable is normal? Well, let's find out together. My guests on this episode are Nick Gowing and Chris Langdon. Their resumes are insane, but I'll just give you a quick overview. Nick Gowing was the main news presenter for the BBC International 24-Hour News Channel, BBC World News, from 1996 to 2014. He presented The Hub with Nick Gowing, BBC World Debates, Dateline London, plus uh, location coverage of major global stories. He spent 18 years at ITN as senior roles, including diplomatic editor, Channel 4 News, he received a BAFTA award. That's pretty big. That's like the news, uh, Oscars for the news, um, in 1982 for his coverage of martial law in Poland. 
Chris Langdon is the founder, director and of Reconciliation Through Film, a charity being established to develop new ways of using communication to help conflict resolution. Chris is a fellow of RSA, Royal Society of Arts. You might have seen those fabulous diagrams that with drawings, that's the, who they are. He has worked extensively on facilitating political reform in Southeast Europe through nine, uh, 2008 to 2010. Uh, he directed the communication, Communicating Europe program for the European Stability Initiative. Chris was a TV producer for the BBC News, ITN, and APTN. Chris Gowing and Chris, uh, sorry, Nick Gowing and Chris Langdon have spent the last four and a half years asking leaders how they are coping with disruption. And the answer was pretty scary. Leaders cannot cope. However, Nick and Chris have some very good news. They found some leaders who can thrive in the face of change. Ladies and gentlemen, put your hands together and help me welcome Nick Boeing and Chris Langdon. Welcome, gentlemen. Hello, John. Good to have you here. A little bit more enthusiasm than the normal BBC welcome, but nonetheless, we are happy that you're here. Thanks, guys. And you know, I've been so looking forward to having you guys on the show. When we had our initial pre-chat, I just found what you were doing fascinating. So let's jump into the title of the book, Thinking the Unthinkable. Why that title? Well, thanks, Dov, for uh, inviting us both on. Uh, I'm in London and Chris uh, is in Switzerland. And uh, we are working on a project which has been going on for five years because when I decided to step aside from the BBC as a main presenter back at the beginning of 2014, that was when Putin decided to do dreadful things in Eastern Ukraine. He also then decided to seize Crimea in violation of international treaties. And when you stop doing a job, it doesn't mean to say you forget about your instincts and the kind of things mm. which have made you employable up to then. And it became clear to me when I was approached by an organization celebrating the death of Churchill 20, 50 years earlier, they asked me, would I do something about leadership? And I said, mm, yeah, maybe. Uh, and in fact, uh, it became clear to me that there was one thing that was bugging me as a professional, which was, why did the European Union let the association agreement with Ukraine go through when they knew it would infuriate um, uh, Putin? And from that, over a flat white coffee, and I have to say, one of the people who was involved was uh, Michael Ignatieff, who used, of, used to, of course, he tried to uh, stand, run for uh, prime minister many years ago, so he has a Canadian history. But he said to me, he now uh, has been at the Open uh, Society University uh, in uh, Budapest, and that has now had to move. But he said, in that, in that beginning of that year, he said, what we're seeing is a new normal, and that confirmed what I was thinking. And through that year, I started talking to people right at the top. I have an enormous contacts book, and many of them admitted to being, as you said, Dov, scared, overwhelmed, fearful of what was going on, but they couldn't put their finger on it. One thing led to another. Chris, I knew, was uh, leaving his job where he was at the Oxford Research Group, and he joined me, Chris, just for a few days, for a few weeks, maybe. Well, I, I saw that it, he was supposed to be joining you for to help you out with a couple of interviews. Exactly. <laughs> and now, four and a half years here later, um, here we are. And uh, Chris has been an absolute mainstay to all of this. There are two of us. Um, I, I tend to work first thing in the morning and through until the afternoon. Chris takes over and works through the night. So we are really a 24-7 service or more a 25-8 service. But we now have other people who've joined us. So something which started over a flat white is really an attempt to reassure um, leaders at the top that actually, if they are scared, which many of them have quietly said that they are, they mm -hmm. can be um, emboldened. And that's what we're up, again, up, up for. We're trying to embolden them, as you said right at the beginning, Dov, to thrive on change. Let me just qualify one thing you said, though, the most disruptive time in history. It's not the most disruptive time in history. We've been through Hitler. We've been through World War I, World War II, the Korean War, and so on. What it is, I think you're putting your finger on is it's the most disruptive time in living memory for most yeah. people. And most people have very short memories. And that's central that's to true. what we're saying. History tells us it's going to be disruptive. The trouble is most people have thought, whether in Canada or elsewhere, that life is going to be pretty good and keep getting pretty good and keep going pretty well. But actually what we've discovered, Chris and I, is that that assumption is flawed and we're not being pessimists. 
we'd like to say we're being realists. And probably um, as uh, one book, which has just come out recently says, the, drung, the jungle is growing back. In other words, we've had it really good for 70 years. And the unthinkable is actually more the unpalatable. Much of what we're seeing now, we could have predicted, but actually most people didn't. Well, we are, we are in very different times um, because there are many things on the horizon that were unthinkable. Um, there were some things that were not so unthinkable, the things that were somewhat predictive, meaning, you know, the rise of AI. We see that now. There's no doubt that AI is on the rise. We know that somewhere between 35 and 40 percent of all traditional jobs will disappear to artificial intelligence or machine learning in some way, shape or form. So that we kind of could see that coming along the rise or on the way. But we've also got the rise of uh, return of right wing politics has come. You know, we're seeing that even in the UK. We've seen that certainly in uh, Brazil. Uh, we've seen that in, in the Philippines. We're seeing that in Hungary. You know, uh, some would say we're seeing that in the United States. So, the, you know, this politically, we've gone to the strong men again, you know, which we haven't seen in, you know, 70 years. We haven't seen that, you know, uh, that's come up again. So is that part of the unthinkable? Is this rise of, of the strong man politics? Is that part of the unthinkable that's causing so much disruption? It's not necessarily, and Chris should come in here on AI, and we've been doing a lot of work on that, but over Chris's left shoulder or right screen as you're looking at it, you can see actually the front cover of Chatham House, which is the Royal Institute for International Affairs in London. We wrote a piece, and you can see it there, the cartoon, um, on the 1st of June, exactly three years ago, virtually to the day of this recording. And we predicted that Brexit would be voted for. We predicted that Trump would be nominated and Trump would be elected as well. Why is that? Because people were not thinking broadly enough about the real mm -hmm. challenges and what we're seeing. And we talk about it not as populism, but as pushbackism. It's pushing back people who feel the world and their lot are not being looked after well enough. And you've put your finger on something which, as I say, Chris has been working on more than me, about the impact on jobs of things like artificial intelligence and algorithms, where most jobs, many jobs, including the professionals like accountants and judges and lawyers, they're going to be wiped out because actually Absolutely. algorithms can do it better. Chris? Yeah, I mean, I think that the jury's still out of exactly how many jobs will go. But what we're saying is there are two really critical decision-making points for society, whether you're in the business leader or you're in government. That is what to do about the future of the planet with climate change, the climate emergency, and also as you've raised of the issue of what sort of society we're going to have. It goes beyond just jobs. Clearly it's going to be job transformation and many old jobs will go, there will be new jobs. And the question is who is going to get the normal employed job? Probably relatively few. So the nature of the job, the nature of society is going to change just at a time when in so many countries, you've mentioned many of them, Dov, where we cannot make decisions. We have uh, basically political elites stuck because the populace are equally divided between those who want the good old ways and those who are basically doing well with globalism. So we are in a really bad situation, we would argue, to, to address these really big questions that, which are pretty much unprecedented in history, the changing nature of society and the economy and the whole issue of the climate emergency. So our, when leaders are looking at this, you know, we talked about leaders being scared. Is that the leaders who are 50 plus are they looking at the world uh, of all this disruption and change differently than millennials who are now at their oldest, 39 years old, as we record this, uh, their youngest 19, and, or Gen Z, who are already just starting to graduate and, and enter into college? Are they are those generations looking at it differently, all this disruption? Let me, sorry, Chris. About Generation Z, I mean, what has been remarkable across the world, and we'll see the next a big issue on the 20th of, of September in 2019 is the rise of Greta Thunberg, a Swedish 16-year-old schoolgirl. Yes. And now we have one to two million school students going on strike on Fridays for the planet. They are, as a European commissioner said at an event I was at, you are the generation getting things done. We, he's 50-something, are not getting stuff done. So there is something different in terms of that 
that generation, and certainly part of that generation, in terms of pushing the climate emergency agenda forward more successfully than previous generations. Let me build on what Chris is saying there, because our main finding, Dob, is the following. The mm -hmm. conformity which qualifies leaders for the top actually disqualifies them from understanding the enormity of disruption, the enormity of change, the scale of it, and then what they can do about it. Because there's a paradox here. If you get to the top of a company or public service or even in a political party, you've got to have uh, conformed to the rules of the game. You've got to have conformed, yes. even if you're thinking something differently, even if you're the brightest person around, you've got to conform because that's the name of the game of promotion and getting status. What right. is clear now is that that is uh, really a serious limiter on understanding. I was at a conference a few days ago where I was talking, I was chairing it and I was talking about the next gen and so on. I hate that, that word youth. And actually there were several people in the audience from the next gen who said, well, it's not hashtag next gen anymore. For you, it's hashtag past gen. Now the problem here is that of course, things still have to be run. Companies still have to be run public services still have to be run, councils have to be run, governments have to be run, and you can't just instantly sweep in 25 year olds with great ideas because whether they like it or not, they've got to understand that things work in a certain way. So I think we're on a cusp here and just to build on a really important point that Chris has just made, which we've been making a long time before Greta Thunberg came along, a 16 year old from Sweden who doesn't travel by, by plane, she travels everywhere by train, which makes it rather difficult to get to Canada. But that's another story. She maybe takes a liner. But we were warning um, eight or nine months ago, and uh, I'm gonna put it very bluntly, that this conformity means that most people in governments, whether the public servants who serve the ministers who are elected uh, as the leading party, or um, uh, corporate leaders are gonna be caught, frankly, with their corporate and public service pants down because mm -hmm. they don't realize how fast and how dramatic the pressure is going to be now from the public, particularly the next generation. And look what's happening. Look what's happened in literally the last few weeks. It's been extraordinary. And they're gonna to have to get out of their conformity, the leaders, because otherwise the next generation, we're not talking about, we're not talking about burning and nasty events. We're talking about, large numbers of very civilized young people who are fearful of their planet, fearful for their planet. And they're saying, please do something about it. And when you saw here in the United Kingdom, you actually saw the person who has been environment secretary, Michael Gove for the last year and a bit. Uh, I don't know what's gonna happen after this recording, um, but he was with Greta Thunberg and there he was sitting looking up at her like that and saying, I feel guilt and responsibility and he's the environment secretary. Um, so things are changing and what we're seeing is those at the top finding it really difficult to move at the speed at which things are happening. And one very senior figure who's now chief of defense staff in the United Kingdom had a great phrase. He described it like this, being a leader now is like trying to eat an elephant in one mouthful because you've got so many pressures on you but there's only 24 hours in a day. I wouldn't want to be a leader. So it's not a question of blaming leaders or telling them they've failed. It's how, as we said right at the beginning, how to embolden them, how to make they can, sure they can thrive on change rather than being intimidated. And it's frankly, a very, very difficult task. But at the same time, we have this psychological issue. And it's, it's not new, it's not now, it's always been. And that is, Psychologically, we don't like change. Psychologically, we like things to be the same, particularly if we're in a position of power. So, you know, you've got, um, you know, we're talking about emboldening people to deal with change, but at the same time, people like Putin are emboldened. <laughs> uh, it, these right-wing leaders that I talked about are also emboldened because, and part of it is because people are saying, as you very well stated, I've had enough. I don't like the system. I want something different. I mean, I spoke about and wrote about how people were saying that, you know, racists had voted Donald Trump in. And I said, that's not true. What's true is the people who voted Donald Trump in are the same people who voted Obama in. They wanted change. People want change. And these strong men are uh, often showing up saying, well, we'll give you change. The problem is it's a new version of that crazy hierarchy, strong men, command and control. So 
when talking to leaders and trying to help them to 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 grasp this, how do how do you, Chris, Nick, how do you speak to those leaders when they're seeing that there is this polarity on one side is is young people next gen who are saying we want change, we want more equality, and we want more global, etc. And on the other side, you're seeing the pol the polarity of that, which is the strongman mentality, and which is the hero mentality of I'm the only one who can save you. What do you say to a leader who's trying to navigate that? Let me let's be clear. Change does not equal better, and that's the profound problem. Mm -hmm. We're in the best time this world has ever seen in terms of stability, by and large, and mm -hmm. in terms of wealth, by and large. And one of the extraordinary things is that it's still not good enough for a lot of people. They believe that life is going to keep getting better and it's going to keep getting better down the same kind of track. Tragically, what Chris and I, I think, have uncovered is that that cannot be guaranteed. We may have had a unique 70 years of stability by historical precedence, and that cannot be guaranteed. And that's why potentially for political and corporate leaders, it's going to be really difficult, really difficult. And Brexit has just added to that. Chris. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm sure those, Chris. Really difficult times ahead in how do we make decisions? It is certainly true that liberal democracy, as we now know it, is a threat. I mean, it is very, it is clearly obvious that the likes of Boris Johnson or Donald Trump know the way to play the new game with Twitter on populism very effectively. And they're not the most populistic leaders. You think of the leader, um, the deputy prime minister in Italy, who was a master of this. And at the same time, you have the autocrats. So those who are more traditional, trying to develop liberal democracy, are clearly all, all at sea. Right. So, and, and could I just come in, Dog? You know, um, one of the things which Brexit and Mr. Trump have rather masked is, them, is some very sinister developments here. I was at the celebration, the commemoration of 70 years of NATO. I was chairing that um, in Washington DC on the 4th of April. I've just been at another couple of gatherings. And what most people are not prepared to accept, and again, we're not pessimists here, we're being realists, mm -hmm. is, the level, is the level of instability that's coming down the track. When lawyers, and accountants lose their jobs to AI. That means they don't have spending power. Think of the hollowing out of communities that that's going to lead, including where you are in a place like, a lovely place like Vancouver. Um, mm. It's the same where I'm sitting here in Southwest London. And it's probably the same where Chris comes from in North, North London normally. But I have, I have attended things behind closed doors here, which I can't source. Uh, you'll have to uh, just believe what I'm saying which are reflected in a, in a quote, which I'm gonna give you now. We are facing, particularly because of China and because of Russia, um, enormous threats to our economic and community stability. It's recognized by national security advisors, it's recognized in government, but they're not sure whether to tell the people about it. I've uh, told the British uh, national security advisor, he should be the national stability advisor. And who knows where we're going in the United Kingdom coming up in November, October, November, uh, mm -hmm. with the business of a, a hard Brexit. You know, that we, are, we have a real rift valley down, down the system here in the United Kingdom. But let me read to you what the Chief of Defence Staff said a few days ago before this recording, uh, to commemorate D-Day, to celebrate D-Day as well. He said, what should we learn from D-Day? We may not be a war in the same sense, but I'm in no doubt that the strategic context is more dynamic, complex, and unstable than it has been any time since then. Quote, threats to our way of life and interests are diversifying, proliferating, and intensifying very rapidly. There's more along in that vein. You know, whether you're frankly in Ottawa, in Vancouver, in London, or many places across Europe, we're kind of on a knife edge. Things like the power, the electricity that's powering our laptops and our communications here, the food which you'll get from your, uh, from your supermarket or your 7-Eleven around the corner, that may not be guaranteed if there's cyber insecurity which cuts all the supply lines. You think I'm dreaming? This is what people are saying behind the scenes. It's a more serious and sinister environment than even during the Cold War. As part of our research, I was with a 48-year-old chief executive recently, and he said, I don't know what you're talking about. I don't know adversity. 
And so that's the problem that politicians are going to have in this new environment. And we sadly haven't seen anything yet. So, so again, what I was going to say is what's clear to me in, in my work, in my observation, in the work that I do is we tend to see things the way they are and we tend to not really pay much attention to the way they the way they can be we've been in a boom now for quite some time we came out of the recession and we went into really into a boom time and people as you said think it's going to continue but ai is going to take jobs there's no doubt about that and as you said we are not in an age of disruption we're entering an age of uh, instability and potential threat uh, we know that China is massive. Its economy is 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 growing every single day. Their GDP is still false, but it's still very strong and getting stronger. Russia, as you said, can do a cyber attack and collapse um, the entire uh, grid system of the United States, which is old very quickly. The threats that exist are, you know, people are looking at North Korea and, and their bombs, and I was like, yeah, that's really not the problem. There are so many other things that, that can crash an economy or do all kinds of damage. So, you know, the interesting thing is that, you know, there's a lot of this that seems, I agree with you. I talked to leaders who were like, what are you talking about? And I'm like, listen, mate, this is, this is happening. This is going on right now under your nose, but because you're getting a big paycheck, you don't want to see it. I get that. I understand that, but it's still happening. How do we prepare? Because you guys did great research and you found out that there are leaders who are thriving in spite of the, um, not just the disruption, but the threats. How do we prepare our listeners, our viewers to say, okay, listen, you may not like this. It's coming. Here's how to thrive. I think Chris should pick up on this because um, we've been doing a lot of work on so what? What are the solutions? We want to encourage people to think they can get over it, but it needs quite a lot of change of culture, mindset, and behavior. Chris. Right. Certainly. And I'd like you to maybe tell a couple of the stories of some of the organizations, Nick, that you've particularly experienced where they have thrived on change by intergenerational intergeneration engagement. But let's give you an example. I was with, uh, at a conference with the corporate vice president of Microsoft. She reckons, in terms of jobs, we need 2.2 million cybersecurity experts who aren't currently doing the job in the next three years. So there are a lot of opportunities. Likewise, when we start talking about a green economy and replacing gas boilers, there are going to be a lot of jobs in the green economy. And there's a new report by the organization which looks at the economies of the Western countries, the OECD. They say that 14% of jobs will go. Their figure is lower because they will argue a lot of the decision making is in our hands. How do we frame jobs? Do they go from 40 hours to 30 hours? How do we think that through seriously? And that's our problem at the moment as societies of working through how do we make the decisions on what are the benefits and opportunities of the green economy, because there will be a lot, as well as the costs, and how do we actually consider the nature of a job? I mean, the job as we now know it, the nine to five job, is a relatively modern invention. So yeah. if we invent that, some people love their jobs, some people hate them. But if we need to think through what is a job, how are people gonna get an income in an age when we have automation, AI, and then beyond that quantum? We have to start radically thinking about those futures. And the best way we argue to look at thriving on change is looking at some examples. So I think, Nick, would you like to describe a couple of the case studies, the examples where we've talked to people? And unlike a lot of case studies, we want to hear the blood, sweat and tears because doing change in organization is scary and needs humility and courage. Nick, why don't you explain a couple of the examples you've come across? Yeah, and uh, it does take courage and it takes uh, getting the board on board, forgive, forgive the pun, it requires creating that community around you. Look, we're, ni neither of us are born leaders. We are investigating why, why it's so difficult. So it's quite difficult for people to listen to us and say, why do these guys have any ideas when we should be doing it ourselves? But the fascinating thing is the stories, Dov, that we've uh, unraveled in a kind of journalistic way. The examples, the 10 examples in our book, Thinking the Unthinkable, are showing actually how if you change your, your, your attitude and you have uh, self-resource, you will also have boldness, you're prepared to take risks, and you've got your board and your executives behind you, then there's a good chance you can, you can uh, pull it off. 
but you've got to be prepared to, as one senior figure said, to fail safely, to experiment safely. And if things go wrong, not be kicked out, actually put that down to great experience. And I say that because one of the great examples is the DBS, which is the Development Bank of Singapore, which sounds really boring, but actually it's a thriving bank in Singapore, which is run by Piyush Gupta, who has been uh, there as chief executive for almost 10 years now, which is almost unheard of. And they were actually, um, after we had already published our stuff, probably no connection, but they were made bank of the year. There are only 26,000 people, but uh, mainly in the Asia region. But why do I say that? Because he says that every day is a startup day. To take the risks that he has had to take in a small nation of five and a half million, he took the board on a trip to Korea. He took the board around with him to get them to back him, even if it didn't work out because he's facing what he calls Gandalf, which is the big corporations, the Chinese and the big tech companies, Gandalf, G-A-N-A-L-F, uh, which is Google, Amazon, Netflix, Apple, LinkedIn, and Facebook, because they are threatening banks. And I can tell you from other work that we've been doing with other big financial institutions, they're on a knife edge of credibility. It's also happening in your country, um, in, in, in Canada as well. They're trying to work out how to survive, um, trying to work out how to survive when the next generation don't understand what money is. They just use a card and that's it. And it's expected to produce some kind of um, uh, account at the end of every month or whatever. Even getting cash, as you know very well, is getting difficult these days. So what's the purpose of a bank? And I say that because he makes it very clear using his staff. He has hackathons inside the bank. He gets the next generation to get really involved to come up with ideas, to scope them. Um, so they're fed into the system. And we've, been, we've seen a lot of companies, a lot of organizations which are top down. If you're at the top, you must be the top and you must know all the answers when actually everyone further down knows a lot more. So being a leader these days is not just about being the leader, the person at the top, it's the person who listens to other people. And that's central to everything we've uncovered and said, actually, the next, the, the people who really probably hold the future of a company or even a civil service in their hands are those further down who've got a real sense of what is happening. And so picking up on Chris's encouragement, those are the places like OCP, which probably no one's ever heard of. It's the enormous potash producing uh, corporation uh, in Morocco. It produces a vast amount of the world's potash. They realized they had an existential problem. Would they still be producing potash? They said, let's get rid of all our consultants. Let's use our, our, our next generation, our under 35s, our under 30 year olds. And they came up with a lot of fantastic um, solutions, all of which were guaranteed to actually have a place in the, in the chief executive and the president's mind. So they would be thought about, and often the ideas were far better than anyone had ever thought of at the higher levels. This is, this is very interesting to me because um, in my last book, Fiercely Loyal, I talked about millennials and leading millennials and, and how what was so important to them was meaningful work, uh, purpose-driven work, and uh, the, the importance of community and mentoring up, down, and sideways. And that we, you know, we come from an old world where we only mentor down, but we need to be mentored up and sideways and that we can learn a lot from the upcoming generations because of their different way of thinking. Um, and you have a chapter in the book, which was about purpose, uh, what purpose is and why. So talk to us about purpose and how that ties into dealing with this disruption that we're moving into in a major way. Chris. Well, purpose is a word that's been banded around a lot, but what we're talking about is really meaningful understanding of what purpose means and then yes. doing this this is not about going back to corporate social responsibility but it's organizations where the leader engages with the staff and defines a purpose of the organization that is beyond profit making beyond shareholder value it's thinking more deeply and it's happening more and more uh, to thinking about your engagement with your key stakeholders be they your employees your supply chain and your community and thinking about a bigger role and often people quote Unilever under Paul Coleman who stepped down in December 2018 because it's an organization which would put the issues of its engagement with the planet at the top of its of its work 
We've heard similar work was done by Indra Nui at, at Pepsi when she was there at CEO. Mm -hmm. But it's that idea that you are doing it for real. And that's what makes it seem acceptable and real for your millennials and your uh, Gen Z. It's really carrying it through. And as Paul Palmer has said at the time they were under a threat of a takeover, it gives you so much capital out there in society that you're able to stand off and withstand the normal short-term uh, rate, capital raid as it was attempted on them. It's this issue which is coming up more and more of moving beyond short-term quarterly returns and looking at long-term value. That's in the private sector and in the public sector, trying to encourage political figures to go beyond the short term, which is where their next votes are. And it's going to be a really difficult change and relatively small numbers of leaders are doing it. And there's some very interesting work that will be coming out in the beginning of 2018, 20, 2020, excuse me, trying to quantify the point that if you ex exercise full focus on your values that actually brings value to your organization in terms that you may be able to quantify in cash terms, but also beyond quantifiable in terms of goodwill and relationships. And it's who's producing what research? It, it, sorry, I beg your pardon. I'm sorry, Chris, who's producing that research into that? Because that's very it's important. Like, Professor Colin Mayer at the Oxford Business School with, with colleagues from uh, the think tank linked to the private company Mars. And it's due out in the, in the spring of 2020. I was at their launch conference a few weeks ago. Yeah, that's just, important work for people to know. We argue there's a lot of talk about purpose, sustainable capitalism, um, all the shareholder value, et cetera. But what, what they're trying to do is to give some metrics to it. Because we know in the business world, if you have metrics, you're much likely to get stuff carried through. Of course. Can, yeah, I, just, can I just add there, Dov? Um, what you're seeing here is Indra Nui called it and, and, and made a great push on this in her last years at Pepsi, performance with purpose. And it wasn't really kind of adop adopted or adapted or by, by most in, in, in business. But that's where she left, when she left the company at the beginning of this year, that's where she had left it, performance with purpose. The next stage is profit with purpose. You can still get profit. And that's where it brings us back, I think, in a circular way, to climate change, global warming, sustainability, and so on. There's money to be made from this and yes. not money to be lost. There may be a transition period. We, we run a small company now, Chris and I, uh, because of what we're doing and because of the scaling up of the demand and interest in this, but we're not running major corporations. Major corporations may say, what do these guys know? Well, we're, what we're doing is we're sharing with you what privately CEOs have said to us and they're now saying to each other. They were even saying it to in Davos, saying to them this to each other in Davos, that the way it's been is not the way that we can continue to guarantee the survival of our company. There was, as I said on, in one of our postings on our website, it's an oh shit moment. Okay, we've got away with it so far, but it ain't gonna survive much longer. Mainly because so many, the next gen in particular, are saying, I'm not gonna buy that product from that company. If I don't like their purpose and I don't like the way they're doing things, they're exploiting stuff, Look at the look at the, bl the the blowback now on veganism. Look at look at the blowback against anything which might have anything which is unacceptable. Quite apart from the Me Too movement, you know, if 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 there's uh, sexual abuse at the top, that is already turning people against various companies. And so it goes on. You know, it's quite remarkable purpose and values. And you could have we, we could have been accused of uh, saying something and smoking something a couple of years ago talking about purpose and values. But actually, that's what customers and also voters want now. Well, so let's go to the other part of this, which I think is we have to address, which is, you know, it's, a, it's part of my concern because the work that I do is helping companies and individuals find their purpose and leave, lead, lead purpose-driven organizations with purpose-driven leaders and, you know, building purpose-driven companies. At the same time, um, I'm always cautious that that becomes rhetoric. Uh, that it becomes just the right thing to say because it's got the right political pull. And we are seeing those kinds of manipulations. You, uh, you wrote a book called uh, Sky Full of Lies and Black Swans. And then in the book, you've got black swans, black elephants, and black jellyfish. Is, uh, maybe that's the same message. But, you know, I'm concerned that people are very easily manipulated because, you know, we see that with the Russian trolls and what happened with, yeah, with the political situation, we can see that these, through social media, through these things, there's a, it's easy to manipulate the emotions of people. You know, how do we, 
how do we get people to connect and actually pay attention to what might be true versus what might be some crazy conspiracy or what might be sold as a conspiracy, but actually is real. Do you know what I mean? How do we get them to wake up a little bit? That's my concern. It's always my concern. I think the, the trauma here, and Chris should come in as well, the, the paradox, the Rubik's Cube, is that more and more, not least because of social media, and you quoted my book from 10 years ago about sky full of lies and black swans, when I was warning that governments would be caught out by what I called the public information space, where, I mean, in those days, social media was a, a, at an early stage. They didn't want to believe that they would lose control of the message or they would lose control of information. Look at what's happened now with drones and so on. And the fact that even in a war, you can't have any operational security anymore because a drone will be up there or people are going to be on their phones or uploading camera stuff or they get shot for doing it. Um, this is a very different time when those at the top have to realize that they are vulnerable virtually at every point because the mm -hmm. public wants to take a view, even if the public is ill-informed or under-informed, it has yes. a very strong view. That's why I think probably Chris and I would, would agree that um, we wouldn't want to be a leader because actually you can't please most people all the time, yet the issues are becoming ever more serious. And this is the crunch, the paradox that we're trying to live with. And you, I just identified in your question as well. Yeah, well, Chris, uh, let me hear from you on this because, you know, you are from the world of film and communications. And so, you know, you know we're seeing a lot of that being manipulated now with, now with uh, deep learning and uh, uh, we've got an echo on here now. Right? And deep fakes, yes. I mean, deep faking, yes. Yeah, yes. The, the, the Finland, which has, I think, one of the best education is now bringing in, bringing in curriculum to people start to try and understand. But let me just, let me just advance the concept in a different way. But I was talking to somebody who is one of the most, the most thoughtful people on climate change. And he said, we spend all our time talking about communicating to the public. We never talk about listening to the public. There are a number of people out there, a lot, probably a large percentage of the population, who have a sense that the weather is changing and therefore the climate is changing, but they feel that a lot of the way they're talked to is they're being talked down to. They're going to have their diesel cars are going to be removed, their gas boiler is going to be taken away. Nobody is actually listening to what would be an acceptable way of making the policy to make the changes on climate change that isn't just the liberal intelligentsia talking down to the rest of the population. And that is the thing that I think that the likes of Trump and Salvini and others have picked up. They're better able to communicate, even though some of them come from elite backgrounds, uh, millionaire sons and all of that. They've somehow got the knack of listening and saying messages across. And those in the sort of the different camp, which certainly I'm part of, the liberal de Democrats, have to get much, get much better at listening and understanding what it would take for ordinary decent people to understand and do quite major changes that climate change will entail. To start thinking that their traditional nine to five job may well change. We need to talk to people and to listen, to understand what it is that is, would be an acceptable solution for them. There's a lot of this uh, pushback, and that's the word we prefer to populism. It's going across North America, it's, it's in, in Australia, it's in Asia, as well as in many countries in Europe. It's because people feel there's a cultural barrier and that there are clever clogs in capital cities telling them what to do and they don't like it. So unless we do as what my mother used to say, you have two of these, one of those using our ears better, as those are part of the sort of liberal democrats of tradition, or whichever political party in that persuasion, but just you have to listen and to frame things in a way that will bring the middle road people along who are easily swayed because they're hearing better messages from the other side. Mm -hmm. And Dov, if I can just add to that, I mean, I'm coming back to that phrase which we've developed, which doesn't exist, called pushbackism. Populism is about a movement, but it doesn't really explain why people are being populist or nationalist. And what you're seeing, and that's what was completely misunderstood by David Cameron here um, in the United Kingdom during the Brexit, and why we identified this before the vote is that people were deeply resentful. They often had misperceptions about the value of Europe. Um, they were caught up in, if you like, a uh, screen of propaganda. They had got a 
Hold on, Nick, because you've now your sound has gone away. You've gone very, it's gone all kind of weird. Mm -hmm. Uh huh. Okay. Can you hear me now, Dov? Now we can hear you. Okay. Um, let me just re rack two sentences and say that there was a, a view taken to push back against everything, even though people were ill informed about the reality, as is becoming clear in the United Kingdom. And that's what we, we would suggest to you is a real core issue. It may be the same in the Canadian election come October. It's likely to be the same and Trump will exploit it in the presidential election coming up. You're seeing it in Italy. You've just seen it in Italy. You've seen it in the European elections. You've seen it as well uh, in France, in Sweden to a certain extent. And so it goes on in Poland and Hungary. There's this Great. kind of sense that even though people have a great life, most people, far better than they've probably ever had, including if they're of the uh, lower income sections of society. People don't think, people think that things should be much better. As a result, they're fed up and they keep pushing back. If someone tells us they've got an even better idea, that's great. But we're trying to say this is not just populism, it's pushbackism. And at the same time, the, 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 the move has to be towards de-hierarchization, too many organizations have lost track of people working for them. And one senior figure in very, one very large ministry here in the United Kingdom said, my problem as the head of this ministry is that too many people are offloading responsibility. They don't want responsibility for the big decisions they should really be taking, which means, and that he used the word de-responsibilization, which doesn't actually exist. So what we're encouraging is you need not mavericks, as such, people are going to be dismissed as mavericks, but you do need mavericks because mavericks are visionaries. You need people in organizations who are going to say, Mr. Chief Executive, Madam Chief Executive, uh, Madam Minister, Mrs. Minister, Mr. Minister, and so on. Have you thought about this? Have you thought about that? And so it goes on. Don't dismiss them as wacky. They're probably not just wacky. They're wise. They, <laughs> they're not stupid. They're also sage. They're, they're, they're wise again. And so it goes on. Even the language. Um, matters a, a great deal and all of what Chris and I have researched and what we're saying is it doesn't cost any money it's about attitude culture mindset and behavior and that comes free if you're prepared to take the risk and you've got backing as well and what we're seeing is private family investors and other big investors beginning to say to big companies you've got to do things in a different way otherwise we're not going to invest in you look at the annual general meetings that are taking place at the moment real pushback now against by investors against the people who've had a nice life, a good life, a well-paid life for a long time in banks and big organizations. Now they're being told that's not the way we want to continue. They're pushing back. So, so what was the turning point for you guys? What was the turning point for each of you that shifted your way of looking at the world, looking at leadership, even, even uh, leadership philosophy? What, what was the turning point for each of you? Chris. Well, for me, I, I joined most recently for having run the Oxford Research Group, which had been looking at what we called the revolt from below. And I'd worked before that for the Foreign Office Conference Center, where I were engaging with leaders. So I was, a, but it was on a different level. And what I then discovered as I was roped in by Nick, as he said at the outset, to do a few interviews. How he did it willingly, though. <laughs> <laughs> how many leaders, as they relaxed, 20, 30, 40 minutes into a conversation, started to admit that they were at sea. They mm -hmm. did not understand the world that they have been put in power, whether in the comp company or in government, to, to control. That was the way that they had thought they were going to do things. And for me, having worked in organizations trying to understand the messy nature of the world, it was fascinating, and that's why I stayed on, um, is to see leaders, frankly, admitting that they do not understand, or if they do understand, they don't know what to do about the whole phenomena we've been talking about in, 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 during the, the first part of this conversation. So for me, just to see that ordinary leaders are struggling was quite encouraging. It's quite worrying as well, because one hoped that they knew what they were doing. And every leader we've met is highly intelligent and sensitive. It's just that the, using methods they learned at business school as they climbed up the pole, as, as Nick said earlier, are not going to cut it. Command and control, as you've written about many times, Dov, does not work in 
most organizations these days. Whenever we can talk about the outliers of the autocrat leaders in politics, within a company environment, command and control, Mark Zuckerberg is the most recent case point for this, it doesn't really work. And it's how we flounder about trying to find new ways to work at the same time as the world is changing dramatically around us. And that for me is the exciting part of this project. How do we help leaders to change or the next generation of leaders when they come in for them to take a different approach to leadership? Mm -hmm. I don't think, uh, De Dov, that we, we're yet at a turning point. I think mm -hmm. it's getting more and more sinister and it takes, it'll take catastrophes within uh, companies and also within government and governance. And that's what we're seeing in the United Kingdom at the moment. We're seeing it across Europe as well. You may see it in the Canadian election coming up as well. Left and right may not exist in future. It's going to be a very different form of politics. So I don't think you're, 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 you're right to ask the question, but I, your implication that suddenly a corner has been turned. We can see the begin. we're in the foothills maybe of uh, potentially success. But there are too many of, dare I say, a certain generation, the past gen, let's call it that, mm -hmm. who really do want to cling to their pensions, who want to cling to their yep. way of doing yep. it, and frankly can't see it um, by their own admission, and they just want to hang on. And they're reinforced often by boards. And there's a very interesting initiative, in fact, run by um, a, a, very, uh, a, very, uh, a very energetic uh, lady, uh, out of Toronto called the Competent Boards, um, uh, Hella Yoga, uh, Christensen and y Jorgensen. And you, you should be talking to her because boards at the moment are supporting, um, if you like, making it easier for people not to, at the top, to, to confront all of this. And that's the tragedy. But let me give you one example. A board member um, asked me, Chris couldn't join me. Um, it was out, outside the UK a very large institution uh, in a foreign country asked me to go and speak to the chief executive, relatively new, of a large organization which was existentially threatened. And I turned up at 6.30 for an eight o'clock presentation. He walked in in a very kind of self-confident way and said, well, I'm here because a member of the board has told me that I've got to be here and the company secretary has fixed it, but I've got 45 minutes. Two hours later, he was still there saying, I'm thinking about things I've never had the time to think about. There's a paradox here. One chief executive of a very large organization, which I can't give you the name of, let it be known a few weeks ago, a, a, an organization which would be well known to anyone watching this and probably you as well, Dov. He said, among other chief executives, I am now running an organization with literally tens of thousands of stressed people. So we were in touch with this organization and said, look, let's try and embolden and change your mindset, behavior, uh, and culture. And eventually the response came back, we're so busy handling everything on a day-to-day -day basis, we haven't got time to think about it. So they've still got tens of thousands of stressed people. But it was interesting and worrying that that chief executive decided to use the word stressed. Absolutely. Shows that people are stressed just keeping their jobs, worrying about whether they'll have a job to keep, whether they'll be replaced by AI, Yet, do you just push it under the carpet and say, for another day, our argument would be no. It's about enormous capacity, which is being stunted in its ability to actually handle these unthinkables and unpalatables. But, but you, you know, as you said, uh, people do want to push it away. They don't want to deal with it. And, it. and it may indeed take catastrophe for people to actually pay attention. But let me just ask you, what... It, what... Can, I, can I just make clear on one thing there, Dov, if I may? Yeah. Because what they then do is they spend then millions of dollars on consultants to fix it, when actually they could have seen it in advance and done it internally themselves. Absolutely. But again, people wait for the catastrophe. They wait for trauma and before they take a response. I mean, you know, uh, I'll give you an example of it just in a simple understanding of psychology is that 60 percent uh, back in the early 2000s, 60 percent of men whose wife has asked for divorce said they were surprised. And when they interviewed the wives of those men, the wives said, I told him for years I'm unhappy. And he said, but we had a good marriage. And I think that that's how people approach life is mm. that very much is like until there's a catastrophe, there's nothing to deal with. And that's that's part of the problem. So with all this research, with all this great insight that you've gotten, both of you, um, I'm going to ask each of you individually, Chris, I'll ask you first, 
What are you presently most curious about? Let me answer your first point. I would have think those wives uh, would, would say their husbands weren't listening. And I'm going to keep on. That's part of I work with reconciliation through film. It's actually mostly about the listening skills. So Absolutely. What we're, what we're most curious about, me personally, is how do we come to some form of framework? And there are lots of nice ethical principles being generated on a weekly basis. How do we come up with a framework for deciding what a job is in, in 20 years time or in 10 years time? How do we change the way we think about society and life for which jobs at the moment are something we give such precedence? That's going to have to change in a world of AI. How do we figure that stuff out is what fascinates me. How do we try and think about other forms at the same time as we have to think about what it is uh, we're going to do in order to make sure that we hit the the target of below 2%, two, 2 degrees by 2050 in terms of climate change. I mean, these are huge things we've got to do. So I'm fascinated by how do we deliberate on two mega problems at the time where we're very, very bad at decision making and deliberating. Good, good. That's a, that's a good point. What about for you, Nick? What are you most curious about presently? Well, my life has been one long curiosity because that's what makes a journalist. You've, every time you say something, you say, how does that happen? Why does it happen? And that's what drove me into journalism. And, what, and, and you don't lead, rather like a doctor or an engineer, you just don't lose those instincts. First of all, I think um, it's the curiosity about why so many people are reluctant to confront the enormity of what is happening and the implications. That's what started driving me independently five years ago, why Chris joined me, why Chris is still with me, why we still talk to each other. We work fantastically well together because we see, this sounds almost um, um, uh, religious, but we see a mission here, which is actually trying to talk to people who don't really want to talk about it and mm -hmm. then convince them that there's another way. Because if this is about saving corporations, potentially saving government and governance, which is in the interest of the people and the customers. This is a, an enormous challenge. And I, I get fired up by the fact that when we, when we have these kind of conversations, you can see that there are minds changing. And even if it's only one mind and then two minds, and then a bit like the Sorcerer's Apprentice, it becomes four and eight and 16. Suddenly you can feel that reassurance, it's like everything among human beings. They want to be reassured that what they're doing is not actually out of the ordinary. When we published our first document saying all of this, people, the, the organization which was going to publish it, known as the Chartered Institute of Management Accountants, they didn't want to publish it. They didn't believe our research. And so we've been rather like Sky Full of Lies 10 years ago, which was about the new vulnerability of power from social media, which people said, what are you smoking there, Gowing? Now we're in the same boat of trying to convince people at the top. They can still earn their salaries. They can still have their jobs. But why don't you just feel brave enough to take a big risk and and really inspire the people working for you because they want to be inspired and i should perhaps tell you that of course millennials are almost the past generation now um in passing of off you know it's now almost two, 20 yeah. years that are uh, coming up yeah absolutely <laughs> and uh, you know as nils bohr said uh, the quantum physicist said sometimes for change change to take place you have to wait for the last generation to die <laughs> Can I just tell you something, if I may? Um, yeah. My mother wrote the history of the nuclear bomb, and she knew Niels Bohr, and I met Niels Bohr, and he was really? an extraordinary guy at the Bohr Institute in Copenhagen. And, of course, he was the person who generated heavy water uh, in Norway and escaped the, the Nazis. So when you mention that, I didn't know you were going to, but um, when my mother came home and said, I've just been with Niels Bohr, and he came in white-haired, and um, very Danish and very quiet, but a remarkable man who, who generated um, heavy water for the nuclear bombs. That was well, the like moment. Said, you... he, he understood that sometimes you just got to wait for people to die for change to take place. And it, because uh, human beings just cling, we, we love to cling to the old way, even if the old way is, is wrong. So yep. we, are, we are coming to the very end of the show here, and I want to just... Uh, uh, I want to wrap this up by asking you a couple of quick questions, both of you. Uh, um, you know, the, as you said, a lot of this is, I think, is very realistic, um, and but it's not sunshine, rainbows, and unicorns. 
um, and we have to pay attention and people don't like to do that too much. But there must have been some stuff about this that you found quite amusing in what you found. What is it that made you laugh about all this? Have we had much laughter, Chris? I think we have had some fun. Because <laughs> I think that's part of the skill in encouraging people to, to confide in, the, in their, their issues. Um, and what's, what's made you most laugh, Nick? Well, I think, I think when actually uh, we've broken through the barrier of being po-faced with, 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 with important people, when suddenly they've realized, actually, we've been talking and reflecting their language, and suddenly they start telling stories about what it's been like passing stuff on. But it's hard because many of them are having to be serious 25 hours a day, eight days a week. And mm -hmm. um, Dov, you, you alerted us to the fact you'd be asking us this question. And um, I found it really quite difficult to find stuff about which one can laugh because there are some pretty serious moments. Um, but there, there have been moments when these kind of discussions have taken place on the Bosphorus in a 35 degree, 40 degree heat on a boat um, going between uh, Asia and Europe uh, and under those massive new bridges. And there have been places where we've had discussions where you'd never ever expect to have discussions. I suppose the one, there is one funny moment, and I'm not gonna say who it was, when, when I was talking and this person was just revealing a heck of a lot about what it was like being a boss, suddenly someone walked past and, and dropped beer over them. But um, that actually lightened the load. So I thought to myself, maybe I should be throwing beer over people or a glass of wine to make them feel much more relaxed. But I haven't yet had the, had the nerve to do that. Bring to reality in that moment. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Listen, guys, we are very close to the end, and I want to ask you, um, this is important, so what I want to ask you is, all this is, I mean, obviously, I want people to go read Thinking the Unthinkable. I want them to, to go to your website, and we're going to give them how to get to all that in a moment, but for now, for somebody listening to this who maybe potentially have gone into a little bit of overwhelm because there's a lot of big stuff here, what is the simple piece of practical advice that you would you would direct to a listener, to a viewer, to say, okay, just go do this now first? What's the practical guidance you would give them? Chris? Well, I think it depends on what their role is. If you're a leader... But they're, they're in a leadership position. Well, that's easy, I think. If you set, sat in, in your, a meeting with your staff and says, on one particular issue, I just don't know, what do you think? could radically change a lot of leaders, how they behave, how they do that. I'm quoting here um, General Sinek Carter, who's the Chief of Defense, and it comes from a four-star general. You've got to, most, <laughs> some people serving him couldn't cope with this because they didn't believe he did it, but greater humility and greater empathy, uh, and a greater willingness to understand the enormity of what is changing. Be yourself, but above all, be bold and accept that the way you've been doing things is not the way that you can survive and your company or your government or your political party can survive. But my goodness, that's a brave, brave position to take. And I was at a, um, it happens to have been a military gathering where at, a, at one of the training colleges where two and three star generals and admirals and so on were being told right at the beginning of their 16 week course, we want you to think in a different way. We want you to realize now you can fail safely, fail mm -hmm. safely. That's tough when you've, got, when you've got voters breathing down your neck, you've got shareholders breathing down your neck, and actually you're worried about your career. I would say actually fail safely is not quite the right phrase. It, would, it should be experiment safely because mm -hmm. there is no clear chart ahead. I've just been at a conference for navigating disruption, which happened to be in Bratislava, where of course the Velvet Revolution happened almost 30 years ago, um, part of Czechoslovakia. Um, and um, uh, what became clear is that uh, you've just got to keep trying everything. Nothing is, nothing is set in, in concrete. And I said, navigating disruption, I don't think most people have even begun to write the charts and draw the charts for disruption, let alone worked out how to navigate it. Navigate it means you know where you're going. I don't think most people do. Yeah, I, 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 this has been great, guys. I mean, you know, I, I actually just recently presented um, uh, in Canada and in the United States uh, a program called How to Thrive 
as a leader in the age of AI. And it talks about how we need, if we're going to survive in the age of AI what we, and the disruption that will come through that, what we need is high levels of empathy, compassion, and collaboration. In other words, shut up and listen. <laughs> yep. So it's, it's wonderful, guys. Listen, this has been a fabulous conversation. I personally would love to continue it, but that's not possible at this time. Yeah, and maybe come back. Yeah, well, uh, I'm, we actually, are, we will talk a little bit about that after we finish here. But what I want to do right now is I want you to tell our listeners, our viewers, where they can find out more about you, about the, about the book, and about the things that you're doing, about the research, all the wonderful resources that you've got. Where should they go to find out more? Well, that's the book. I'm holding it up. You can see it's got the same cartoon as the one over Chris's left shoulder, Thinking the Unthinkable, available on Amazon. Um, and our website is www.thinkunthink.org. I'm available at nick, N-I-K, at thinkunthink.org. And Chris? What about our Twitter feed, which is think underscore unthink? And your email address? Uh, that's chris at think on think.org. And may I just say at the outset, thanks to the, to the guys at the Bahi Cafe here in Bregenz who've let me use their space tonight. That's awesome. Um, is, there, is there anything, any other thing that you would like the listeners to do to reach out to you or, or to, to, to do to, to make the difference a little bit more so they are stepping into, into this a little more, preparing themselves to actually recognize those uncharted waters? We quite often stumble upon very senior people by accident, and they have made um, our case studies, and people have approached us and just wanted to talk about their experience, partly because uh, actually they want people to learn from what they've been through, negative or positive. So actually hearing from people um, would be really very, very helpful to us. We respect confidences, everything is under lock and key, and we want to be in a position where, if possible, we can actually relate what is told to us in a, in a written form so others can learn. If this is existential for us, quite apart from climate change, existential for government, governance, and the corporate sector, then I think we all have a duty. We're doing this because, not because we're trying to make money or anything, because that's not an issue. It's about actually facilitating to make possible a new way of thinking about leadership. It may be an uphill task, but uh, at least there are those who are very appreciative for what we've done. Well, gentlemen, I am sincerely grateful to both of you. That's also challenge us as well. Challenge us. Yes, please. Uh, join the conversation with us. And thanks yeah, very much. Well, it, it has been a pleasure and honor, gentlemen. I hope you'll stay with us to the end. I want to thank you both. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, again, I encourage you as a listener, as a viewer, to don't just listen, but actually take action. Remember, information is worth the whole in the donut. Transformation comes from application. Go out, get the book, Thinking the Unthinkable. Get a hold of the book. Look for it. Uh, we want to thank Nick Gowing, and we want to thank Chris Langdon. Again, you can find them and, and all of their research at thinkunthink.org, O-R-G. You can hang out with other conscious leaders and chat about this episode or any past episodes on our Facebook page. Just go to Dov Barron's Leadership and Loyalty Podcast to find out more about hiring me, Dov Barron, as your speaker or strategist for your organization. You can simply go to fullmontyleadership.com forward slash consulting or fullmontyleadership.com forward slash speaking. Be aware that the research consistently shows that the fastest growing companies face the same challenges that you do. They're spending a ton of money, energy, and effort trying to attract, train, and develop top talent. Also, they're having them leave at an alarming rate. If you are frustrated with it, investing in training and developing your talent only to have them leave before you get your ROI, then come talk to us at fullmontyleadership.com, where we provide the essential leadership skills to rekindle and amplify the hidden loyalty assets inside of your organization by tapping into purpose fullmontyleadership.com because you can't outsource authenticity. I want to thank you for sharing the show with everybody you know. Till next time, stay curious, my friends. Stay curious about thinking what is unthinkable by taking a look at the things you don't want to look at, the changes that are coming that are inevitable. And instead of pulling the blanket over your heads, open up, look out, and see what's in front of you because if you tap into it ahead of time, you can be at the front of that wave. I'm Dov Barron, I'm here to assist you tapping into your deep greatness. 
to reach that next level of clarity, focus, purpose, and profit in your business, your life, and your leadership impact. And I am out.